to all, and welcome to the MR Running Pains podcast. This is Aaron Saft, and we have a great episode today with Jake Edmiston, a registered dietitian. It's quite a long episode, so uh, I hope you guys can enjoy, learn something. We'll be talking about all things nutrition, uh, in-race, training, daily. So um, I took some listener questions and answered those at the end, uh, so really had a a good talk with Jake, uh, really engaging, and I learned a lot. I hope you guys do too. Um, at the end, um, I'll talk about how you can reach out to Jake if you're interested. So a few housekeeping items that just want to go over before we get started. Uh, this uh, current pandemic has really kind of forced me to be present um, and uh, be very mindful um, as well as grateful for, for what I have and what is in my life. Um, I've been uh, been with my kids every day, which has been wonderful. Um, we go out for a walk every day. We've been plogging, um, kind of picking up trash along our street, and uh, we've been swimming in the river and playing catch with my son, um, playing soccer with my daughter, riding bikes. Um, it's been been a wonderful time here with my family. I, I, I really value that time, and I, I hope you guys are too. Um, I know this is a, a really tough, straining time for most of us. Uh, of course, worry about my wife, who's daily going out to uh, to her family practice, um, seeing patients. You know, it's uh, it's a, a risk uh, on a daily basis, and um, you know it's 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 hard in that regard. But um, you yeah, know she's she's our uh, she's our breadwinner right now. Um, you know, things are, are tight. We've had to tighten our belts, as I'm sure most of you had. So um, just want you to know, you know, I I hear you. We're, uh, we have to be in this together and support one another. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're hurting, reach out. Reach out to your friends, to your family. Um, you know, we got to make it through this together somehow. So just know that uh, you know, there are people out there that are willing to help. So. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, got a bunch of stuff going on, you know, um, talking about everything. Um, FooterX, the shop. Um, we're trying to check the, the FooterX staff at gmail.com. Uh, you know, that account each uh, each Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, we'll be calling people on, on Wednesday if you need shoes or anything. Um, please just email us during the week with your phone number and, and what you're looking for. Uh, well, and like I said, we'll probably give you a call either Tuesday or Wednesday each week to try to fulfill the order. Um, it's tough right now. I mean, you know, not really supposed to be going out. Uh, so, uh, we certainly appreciate the continued support for, for the shop. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, um, how to best, um, shut it down, unfortunately, um. You know, Scott and I have have talked about it a lot. Um, it's really hard, but you know, get taking out another loan right now really isn't in our our best interest or something we're really able to do. So, um, but we'll keep moving forward. That's all we can do. Um, Hellbender, um, Hellbender once again has a new date, uh, November twentieth and twenty first. We're looking for volunteers. Registration is reopened. Um, there are just a, a couple of people on the wait list. And uh, as people come off of registration, um, then uh, we'll add back from the wait list. Um, which brings me to the fall. Lord knows what the fall will bring. Um, you know, as I've, uh, as I've heard, um, I don't mean to create panic, but, we, you know, we could see phase two of, um, of corona in the fall. Um you know, it's, it's doubtful that we're going to have a cure by then. So, um, fall races might be canceled, which is scary and crazy. Um, you know, I've had, uh, um, my racing season postponed as well. Um, the, uh, my next race was, uh, was going to be strolling gym. Now they still haven't made, a a, a commitment to cancel or postpone the race, but, uh, it's May 2nd. I, I don't see that happening, obviously. Uh, and then after that, I was supposed to go home to New York to run the Orange Classic 10K. And uh, that is canceled. And then after that was supposed to be Kettle Moraine. And that is postponed till September. 
so um, that brings me uh, to a local race that I um, I signed up for. I don't know if it'll happen due to the timeline, but um, I wanted to support this local race, uh, Assault on Black Rock. It's a, a mountain ascent and descent, so fun little mountain race here, just over seven miles long. Um, and, uh, um, so I'm hoping that that happens. Um, the first time I ran that race, um, uh, the volunteer that was supposed to be at the turn had to go down because it was snowing and, and cold and she wasn't dressed appropriately. So, um, and the, there was no sign. So I went the wrong way. <laughs> so I'd like some redemption out on that course. Um, uh, see if that happens or not. But beyond that, um, be training for the 50 K trail national championships at ragged mountain up in, uh, New Hampshire. I uh, did that two years ago. I was the 10th male, um, first in the, uh, 40 to 45 masters category. So, um, wanted to f- go back and, and run that, see if I can do, uh, do better overall. And, um, anyhow, um, I, uh, I also, I have a new coach, um, working with, uh, David Roche and his, uh, swap team. Um, it's, it's been great so far. Um, turnover is really coming along. I really like his positivity and feedback. Um, so been working with him. Um, my coaching services, uh, as I said, they're, they're open right now. Um, I know this is not the ideal time. So, um, but the, uh, um, uh, I've been talking to to my athletes about uh, the potential for the fall, and as I was just saying, you know, with with cancellations, postponement, and uncertainty, um, we're kind of creating a uh, a plan B. You know, um, it may be like a a treadmill challenge. You know, uh, do you want to try to PR at the five k or uh, or try to you know run the long distance? Um, you know, so it could be a treadmill challenge. But anyhow, um, those are are things that you know I'm. I'm tell my athletes to kind of consider right now because we don't know what the fall will bring so um have a have a backup plan for the fall uh, and if you're interested in coaching please reach out <clears throat> my email is running pains at gmail.com um the website mrrunningpains.com it's um uh, it's um uh, we're we're working on it thanks to victor mariano he's been helping me kind of redo the website make it a little accessible um make all my newsletters um um you know, uh, available to you as well as, um, the podcast. Um, so, uh, website under construction, it's still up right now. Um, you can subscribe to my newsletter on there, my monthly newsletter, uh, put a lot of information and, and work into that to, uh, try to make it as formative as possible. So, um, please subscribe to my newsletter on my website there. Um, what else? Uh, the YouTube channel just posted a new video. Uh, so, uh, please subscribe to that. It's uh, Aaron Saft. You'll just search Aaron Saft channel. It should pop up. Um, I posted a video on flossing for ankle mobility um, and had a few comments about I uh, thought it was going to be a dance move, but um, it's uh, it's really great uh, mobilization for the ankle, which is super important for our running. So check that out. And then again, please subscribe. Um, let me know what you want to see on there. Um, the podcast itself, it's up on iTunes and Google Play right now. I have submitted it to the other platforms and uh, waiting for acceptance. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, I think that's it for now. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And uh, thanks, Jake, again for coming on. And uh, we'll talk to you at the end. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the MR Running Pains podcast. This is Aaron Saft coming to you with uh, our first remote interview with Jake Edmondson. And uh, please say hello, Jake. Hi, how are you doing, Aaron? <laughs> I'm doing good, buddy. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. If you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm a Registered dietitian in the state of New Mexico. Uh, We moved here about five years ago. I got my graduate degree from New Mexico State. Uh, We moved from North Carolina, so that was 2015. I got my undergrad from Appalachian State, uh, so I'm mostly from North Carolina. My dad was military, and he retired up tired in Fayetteville, Fort Bragg area. So, uh, yeah, so I got my you know undergrad at App. Moved out to New Mexico State, uh, graduated, and have been practicing as a full-time registered dietitian for the past three-plus years or so. So, 
Excellent. Thanks, buddy. So Jake uh, started near and dear to my heart at uh, NC State um, and then uh, sought his own avenue, which is which is awesome. Um, can you uh, define what a dietitian is for us? So a dietitian, if you actually look up the definition, the Oxford definition said an expert in nutrition. Um, and basically the reason why you get to that is because to be have a dietitian, it's federally regulated. Uh, you have to have an undergraduate degree in a nutrition related field, dietetics, which is mostly going to be science based. And then you can either do one or two routes. Uh, you have to do a dietetic internship or you can do a combined program and get your master's combined with a dietetic internship. And the internship consists of, you know, 1,200 plus supervised hours plus meeting for classroom time and then, you know, com- you know, having certain tasks you have to make and competencies you have to hit. And then once you do that and graduate from the internship, then you have to actually pass the RD exam, which is a federally regulated exam. You, you know, they do all that good stuff when you go into the exam and pat you down, make sure you can't bring anything in and you sit there in front of a computer and it's anywhere from a hundred to 125 question exam. And, um, yeah, you pass that and you get to be a registered dietitian. So, and that's, that's really the the main difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist. Um, you know, a nutritionist, you can, you know, go online and find certifications, uh, certificates to become a, nutritionist you could actually have your bachelor's degree in nutrition and be a nutritionist so it's not to say like you know nutritionists are all you know they don't know what they're talking about because there can be a very competent nutritionist but they're not regulated um, like a dietitian would be so as a dietitian you're more likely to see them in like a hospital setting and clinical settings whereas a nutritionist you often won't find um, in those types of settings so what would be the reason um, one would see um, a dietitian versus a nutritionist? I mean, as you just said, like it may be more in a hospital setting, but I imagine there are dietitians like yourselves that would want to work with athletes and such. So um, what would be uh, the reason somebody would see a dietitian and the reason someone might see a nutritionist? So a dietitian is usually going to be more, um, like I said, clinically focused or have like a sports um, credential as well. And this is going to be more for maybe like chronic diseases or really particular sports areas. Um, So like, you know, diabetes, renal failure, um, heart disease, most of those people are going to, you know, you'll get referred by a doctor a lot of times to see a dietitian, whereas you're not going to get referred by a doctor to see a nutritionist. Um, and then elite athletes, you know, if you, any sports teams now or the Olympic committees, you pretty much have to have a registered dietitian. And usually they're looking for the credential for the sports specialist dietitian, which is CSSD, which requires a whole, once you have a, your registered dietitian credential, then that's a whole another certificate on top of um, the registered dietitian. So that takes about 2,000 hours of practice, and you, which you have to obtain with um, that certain group. So, you know, they kind of make it broad for people to get the credential as far as, you know, you can work with amateur athletes um, looking for improvement or maybe even weight loss to get um, to count towards your hours. And then once you get that, then you're, you know, you're more likely than you can maybe run, a, you know, a sports program for a collegiate, uh, co- you know, a college, or you can, you know, work for the Olympic Committee, you can work for sports teams. A lot of sports teams actually hire dietitians now, and sometimes some are full time, some are half time. It just kind of depends. Nutritionists, a lot of the certificates you really see if you look online are more for, say, like a um, a fitness trainer to try to get some knowledge around nutrition in general. So maybe like a a coach wants to expand their you know horizon and be able to just give you know basic information or um, you know, for their clients, they can take a lot of those courses and, you know, get like more well-rounded on what types of diets, weight loss, you know, calorie counts and things like that. And so most of your nutritionists are usually going to be, you know, people looking for more just like the weight loss and some general knowledge in in general. Obviously, you can have nutritionists that can go on their own and don't want to go through the whole program and be just as smart as anybody else. And so... 
So as a dietitian, um, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of people that, uh, have celiacs. Would you be able to work with, you know, a person that has uh, celiacs and kind of set them up on a, uh, a plan as to what they, what they can be eating and uh, how about that type of. Yes. Athlete? I mean, so you can work with celiacs, any autoimmune disease, allergies. I mean, you would, yeah, as a dietitian, you should be well-versed in pretty much any of those types of, um, you know, food elimination diets. Cause obviously with celiacs, you're avoiding gluten. So, you know, and that's the protein and the wheat, barley, rye, those types of foods that, it's actually an autoimmune disease where your body it actually attacks the celiac or the gluten protein. Um, and so it, it kind of turns on itself. So yeah, you're just really trying to avoid it. And a lot of people, you know, I guess this is off tangent, but a lot of people actually did find out they have celiac disease because they become iron deficient. Cause what happens is your body starts attacking itself and your little, your intestine, the microvilli that you have are the things that kind of catch nutrients and they have all these little wavy fingers that catch the nutrients and help you bring them into your intestines and get across the border into your blood. And so when you have celiacs, those actually start attacking themselves and those microbial die and start to lay down. So your absorption of minerals and micronutrients um, starts to be severely inhibited. So that's, you know, that's the reason why celiac patients really want to avoid gluten because it's really going to start complicating other absorption issues for other minerals. Thank you. Um, so you had said that you are going for your master's um, in more of a specificity for, for athletes. So um, for that, um, what should athletes look for, um, you know, uh, when looking for a dietitian? Um, what type of uh, certification or um, what type of dietitian are they are they looking for? Right. So, you know, you don't have to have, like I mentioned about the certified sports specialist dietitian. You know, that's, that's one of my goals. Um, since I've been, you have to be, have the 2000 hours within five years. And so, you know, I currently work mostly with long-term care, development, disabled clients. And then, uh, I, I work at a gym to help myself, uh, pick up those extra like athlete hours. And then I also pick up just other clients like, you know, local running groups and things like that to help out. But really when you, you know, like anything you're going to, anybody you're going to work with, you really want to meet with the person, kind of figure out what their expertise is, um, make sure they're a right fit for you. Like, you know, just like if you were going to a therapist or coach, you know, you guys want to make sure that you align and your goals and how they can help you. Um, so, you know, if you are a, an elite athlete, you probably are looking for that, you know, certified sports specialist dietitian um, credential. However, if you're an amateur athlete, you know, most registered dietitians, can either point you in the right direction to somebody who is more sports based or, you know, can help you themselves. So, you know, for me, I feel confident in my abilities and I, you know, I love working with athletes. So, you know, if it's a good fit for both of us, then I would proceed from there. But, you know, just, and you can even look on the scan website, which is sports cardiovascular and uh, nutrition. And they have a whole page of, um, you know, sports dietitians, and they may or may not have the credential. So that's a group that registered dietitians can join and put in their information so people can find you. So that's always a good resource as well. And that pretty sure it's scan.org or scandp.org. I'd have, um, I can always get, I can send you that link. If that's a, yeah, I would put that in the show notes. Um, thank you. Um, anything else we should touch on with the, uh, um, education certification um, between the two before we move on? No, I mean, you know, like I said, if, if you find a nutritionist um, and because they don't have an RD, like I said, I'm not here to, to bash or anything. A nutri- you know, they can be just as good and work with you. Um, so it's really just about finding the proper fit for you. You know, if you, you know, the RD kind of gives you that kind of well, you know, you know that they've been at least backgrounded, you know, they, they have the background, you know, they went through the process you know, a nutritionist, you might have to do a little bit more digging to make sure they're actually a right fit. Whereas at least, you know, with the dietitian credential, they've gone through the steps to, you know, obtain that, um, at least minimum, minimum level of uh, education to get that credential. So it's, you know, really kind of doing your due diligence, but that dietitian credential does give you just a little bit more knowledge going into a meeting to know that they've put in the work in that first part. 
Cool. Um, as we discussed, we had a lot of listener questions, and we're going to kind of get to those, but um, I think maybe we'll answer some of them as, as we go through uh, to this next part. Um, now, um, we have all sorts of um, you know diets out there, and uh, as I said, I, I don't want to get into <laughs> debating um, what's what's the right one or um, you know what everybody should be doing or how. They oh, there's only one true path, Aaron. Uh, only one true path. You know, that's... <laughs> you can you can say it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Definitely um, a joke. <laughs> um, but um, I do want to discuss good eating habits, um, no matter what you know, whatever path that person's on. Um, so, um, you know, there's, um, there's a, a lot of stuff out there as to like how many meals a day we should eat. Um, should we eat, um, smaller meals more times a day? Should we have our three squares? Um, what's, what's the latest research? What are you hearing? Well, the way to kind of break it down, you're always looking for quality of food. I mean, that should always be kind of your, you know, first choice, like looking at, What's that, what am I actually eating? You know, really being purposeful about why you're eating. You know, a lot of people do a lot of just grazing and eating as you go. And really meals and snacks should all be kind of purposeful. Like, you know, it doesn't mean they don't, can't be pleasurable because they should just be, you should really understand, you know, what, what you're eating for. Um, and so like, you know, just a regular person, you know, that's not an athlete, you're probably, they're very good with probably just three meals a day. Um, you know, they, you can do the three meals, you know, some people will, you know, try the small meals multiple times a day. The problem with your average person that's not an athlete is those meals tend to get bigger and bigger. And people, even though they're trying to eat smaller portions, end up eating like regular portions six times and start adding weight. Um, so that's not usually preferable. Now, somebody that's an athlete and they're working out, you know, regularly training hard, you're really going to be looking for anywhere from five to six meals a day. You're going to have your three meals plus usually an AM and PM snack. So, you know, say like 10 or 11. And then again, um, uh, around like three or four, you know, so and ideally you want to space your meals out every three to four hours. So when you space your meals out, this allows for absorption and uh, it's better for blood glucose control and so you want to kind of wake up, say you eat at seven, then you would eat at 10, one, four, kind of seven again. Um, if you're really looking for like muscle mass and putting on a little bit of extra muscle, it's good to have like a late night protein um, has been shown to be beneficial for muscle synthesis. Uh, but that's really how you should be structuring your day. You know, it's the more active you are, you should kind of the more meals you should be doing. And those should be, you know, as the more active you are, they should have a good quality protein, whether that's animal or plant-based, whatever diet you're choosing to do. Um, they should have, you know, definitely vegetables or, you know, healthy, you know, healthy carbs. The, you know, what, what a dietitian really will help you with is when to structure your more complex carbs and when to lower them. So if you're working out in the morning, you know, maybe your lunch is a little bit bigger with your complex carbs, which are going to be your breads, potatoes, rice, grains, and then you maybe eat a little bit less of those for your dinner um, kind of thing. And really, like if you're not working out, now they show that you, you should really eat breakfast as your biggest meal, kind of reduce the size for lunch and then make uh, dinner your smallest, which kind of goes, you know, there's a lot more research now with our, uh, what's the like circadian rhythm and how we process food. And in the mornings, you know, we're, you know, basically ready for the day and your body's actually going to store more food as glycogen. Whereas at night, you know, you're winding down and it's going to be storing it more as fat. So you actually get better use and utilization from your breakfast than you do at night. That being said, say if you're, you know, not somebody who likes to work out in the morning and you're doing hard efforts, you know, in the evening, then you're going to have to eat a little bit more carbs and stuff to refuel. And maybe your dinner ends up being your bigger meal. So, you know, there's always, you know, circumstances where, you know, nothing holds true, but a good rule of thumb would be to make your breakfast, your bigger reduce, you know, lunch a little bit smaller and dinner kind of your smallest meal. And that's actually been shown to help with like blood sugar control, 
um, you know, heart disease later in life if you are aren't working out. You know, eating later um, in the day with your biggest meal has been shown to increase your risk for like heart disease and and that kind of stuff. And really, you shouldn't be a uh, eating before bed unless there is a, a purpose to it. Again, go back to what's my purpose of eating. And so, if you are having like really intense workouts and you're or in your you know, trying to get those muscle gains or keep that lean muscle, <laughs> having a good source of protein before bed, you know, about 30 minutes to an hour before bedtime would be appropriate to help you with your muscle synthesis and retaining muscle. Let's touch on that for a second. <clears throat> Cause that was one of my questions was, okay, so if we're going to have um, a good source of protein before bed, um, is there a recommended amount of grams of protein that we would suggest before bedtime? So if you're looking for muscle synthesis, which probably most runners and just, you know, maybe lifters and things like that are, you actually want more protein than what's in your normal meal has been shown in a lot of research. So like say a typical meal, you're looking for anywhere from 20 to 30 grams, you know, spaced out that three to four hours. And then at night to help you get through the whole night, because you got to think you're basically going fasted for eight, you know, hopefully eight hours for your sleep. You know, that's what we should be kind of striving for. (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're going to be fasted for that time. So they've actually recommended like, say, uh, up to 40 grams of protein has been shown to help um, muscle synthesis throughout the night. Now, if you can't do 40, I mean, 40 grams is can be quite a lot. So, you know, that's where maybe your supplements become handy where like a protein powder where you can just take a little shake uh, about, you know, 30 minutes to an hour before to help with that. Um, but that's, yeah, the science is showing you actually want more, um, yeah, most of the research papers and clinical books I've read have all, you know, anywhere from that 35 to 40 range is kind of what you're shooting for. If you want to maximize muscle synthesis, that being said, you still want to make sure you're eating your, you know, meals every three to four hours. You know, it's not like you can skip the whole day and then have that one protein shake and you're going to be good to go. You, you know, Priority should be fueling during the day. And then, you know, the next priority should be that late night meal. Right on. Uh, Let's touch on the source of protein. Does the source of protein, does that really matter? Um, Whether it comes from whey protein or pea protein or, you know, what have you? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, what you're really looking for is the leucine content. Um, A lot of the plant-based proteins um, are a little bit lower in leucine. So, you know, as a, if you're a vegan athlete or a vegetarian athlete, you, well, vegetarian athletes would still be using a lot of the whey proteins normally. But if, say, you are doing um, more plant-based, you might want to be supplementing with um, like BCAAs, which are branched chain amino acids. They're your leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, and pretty much leucine is what they describe as kind of the catalyst to kick off um, muscle, muscle synthesis. So if you don't have enough leucine, you could be taking all the amino acids and protein in the world, but if you just don't have any leucine, you're not going to build any muscle. So you need that leucine to kind of trigger muscle synthesis. So, on, you know, the plant-based proteins are usually limiting in, in the leucine um, amount. You're looking for usually about three grams to five grams is what you know most research articles report that you need with a meal. Um, you know, a lot of protein powders are actually going to add leucine in because they realize this. So if you're taking a protein powder, you're probably not too worried, but if you're just, you know, eating, trying to eat all whole foods, no supplements, then having like, well, I guess if you're, you know, either eating more, more plant-based to get your leucine content up. So maybe you actually would have to eat like 40 grams of protein to kind of get that leucine number up there. Um, or just taking like a BCAA supplement. What? Sorry. What is a good source of leucine um, food-wise? Uh, so you're looking um, – beans are a little lower, so you're you're going to be looking more like for your grains, like your rice are going to have a little bit more leucine. Um, and so like that's why like a lot of the, that combining came with like beans and rice. Um, but even that, you know, the, it's, it's, it's better but not, not as great. So again, like it, it might just help just – you know, usually with vegans, I tell them that, you know, it's a little bit easier just to take a BCAA supplement, but you can always, you know, you, you really are going to have to eat more protein in general. If you're a vegan, if you're looking for muscle, like a normal person not working out, then you don't really have to worry about it. But if you're an athlete, you're probably wanting to supplement to help with uh, muscle synthesis. 
I have uh, no brand representation or, or loyalty to any brand when I say this, but um, I do take the, the goo has the BCA uh, mm -hmm. capsules uh, and they do have the branch amino acids and the leucinine um, yeah. in them. Um, so I, 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 you know, after my run, usually I'll have those. Um, so uh, yeah. good product there. If you're looking for a supplement, um, I, I like yeah, that. You can, I, I buy, a, I buy just my powder online on Amazon. Yeah. I don't, the brand is, you know, you can find them pretty cheaply. Like I, I buy, uh, you know, the powder for like 15 bucks and it lasts me two months probably. I mean, cause I just take a teaspoon, you know, a teaspoon is a good measure. It's like around four point like eight grams. You can round it off to five if you make it a little rounded. So you do that, you're pretty much will hit your, you know, your BCAAs. And that's, that's about your most economical that I've found for adding your BCAAs in. Nice. Thanks, man. Um, so you, you kind of mentioned uh, about the meals, how we should kind of taper it off, especially to, to help with sleep. Right. Um so, so, uh, like I know we had, we could have the protein shake before, before bed, but how, how soon should we stop eating before bed to, to guarantee the best night's rest? Yeah. So most stuff, there's not, I haven't really seen really good science. I mean, you know, it might be out there and I've just missed it, but a lot of just the recommendations in general is just try to stop eating in about 30 minutes before bed. Um, you know, high fat meals tend to disrupt sleep a little bit more. Um, real sugary meals, obviously stuff with a lot of added sugar, isn't something you want to eat before going to bed. Um, you know, protein is actually shown to actually help with sleep, sleep quality. Um, so like whether you're doing like the, the protein supplement or nuts, some nuts even have a lot of melatonin in them. Um, like pistachios actually have a good source of melatonin, which is, you know, your hormone to help you sleep better. And then, you know, even, uh, I've, was reading tart cherry juice actually has a little bit of melatonin. So one of the studies showed that a little bit better sleep um, was inhibited when you took just an ounce of tart cherry juice about an hour before bed uh, to help with your sleep. So those uh, go right ahead. Oh, and then like, you know, obviously you want to avoid caffeine before sleeping. That's going to, you know, make it hard to fall asleep, make you more jittery. Your sleep's not going to be as good as quality. Um, and that kind of thing. So it's, you know, there's no real, you know, basically the high fat meals you probably want to avoid, you know, before closer to bed. Um, and then caffeine and added sugars um, are the probably three things. And then if you are doing like a protein based, give yourself about 30 minutes to an hour, you know, to take that in. The other supplement I've heard for sleep aid, and you can, you know, ponder on this or let us know what you think is magnesium. I've heard uh, taking magnesium before bed is also a, a good sleep aid. Anything on that? So I know, mag you know, magnesium is a uh, kind of helps relax the muscles. And so I really haven't seen much research comparing it to sleep. Uh, but you know, it is a kind of it helps like your intestines react. Like if you're ever like kind of dehydrated and um, you're kind of cramping in, you have a little bit of nausea, taking a little magnesium will usually help your like stomach you know, release. Um, and so it is, you know, it does help just kind of relax you. So that's probably where that's coming from. Like I said, I'd, I'd have to do a little bit more research into if there's good science behind magnesium and sleep. But I mean, there's, if you're taking it in small supplies and, you know, a, appropriate doses, there shouldn't be much that magnesium is going to hurt you on. Cool. Um, <clears throat> you already touched on how much uh, protein we should be kind of uh, getting through each meal. Is there a balance? Like when we talk about, I hear uh, the term macros, you know, thrown around a lot. So is there a balance that we should be looking at between our uh, protein intake, carbohydrate intake, et cetera? Yeah. So there's, you know, you know, everybody's going to have like kind of their own, what makes them feel the best as far as like percentage wise, really, when you break it down, you should really look at your activity level um, and kind of get down how many, how much protein you're going to need first. So, you know, usually your kilogram, you take your body in kilograms for highly active people. Now the recommendation is anywhere from 1.2 to 2.5. Um, and really, if you were just, you know, you want to space that out appropriate, like we talked about, you know, every three to four hours hitting anywhere from, you know, 20, 30, 35 grams of protein for every meal. And if you were doing that, then you'd pretty much hit your protein. Your Carbohydrates really are going to fluctuate depending on your activity level for the day. 
the less active you are, um, the le really less carbohydrates you need. Um, and really you should always be eating your, your vegetables. Um, so you're really going to limit your, like, you know, your rice, your potatoes, your breads. Those are the things that you would eat usually increase and decrease. Um, macros are a good tool. You know, they're not, they're not the end all be all because like anything you're going to use an equation to find somebody's macros, you know, you're going to use their activity level. You can get real precise and, you know, use, different uh, measurements to find a little bit, you know, be more precise, but like the Harris Benedict, if you just know your um, height and weight and activity level is one of the more better predictors of ener you know, energy equations, but even that's going to be off a little bit. So, you know, like I said, macros are a tool in your tool belt. It's nothing to stress about. Like, you know, if you're at the end of the day, you're like, Oh, I'm, you know, five grams short of my carbs. You know, I, I need to eat something real quick. You know, that's nothing to really stress about. They're kind of get a good gauge, um, but you also need to be able to adjust them appropriately based on your activity level. And really, you should be timing them like like we talked about earlier, more carbohydrates like after meals, and you know maybe less farther away from the exercise. <coughs> I mean, I mean after workouts. I apologize, uh, and then like a little bit less. Um, so like a lot of more of your non-starchy uh, vegetables. You know your broccoli, your spinach, your cauliflowers or things like that farther away from your workouts so that's where it kind of comes to play and then really you fill in the fat so you you find your protein you find your grams of carbs and then you kind of fill in the rest with fat and you really want to focus on your healthy fats you know your you know your omega-3s your polyunsaturated you know you still need some saturated fat in your diet um, you know that could go into a whole nother rabbit hole if we get into it about people saying saturated fat is <laughs> is 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 good or bad for you but you, you know a little bit you know all the recommended guidelines say you know less than 10 percent uh, of your overall intake from saturated fat but you know you know your avocados and things like that <coughs> that are going to be a little bit healthier for you excellent so at all that said is there a you know, a, a caloric goal that we should be shooting for during the day. I mean, I know it's going to depend on activity once again, um, probably your weight, et cetera. But is there a, I mean, typically we heard of the 2000 calorie diet, but is that, you know, is that buckus? <laughs> well, the 2000 calorie diet is, you know, basically an average and that's for basically non athletic, um, people, you know, it's just like, you know, and, yeah, it's like 1500 for women, 2000 for men. I mean, it's not so much bumpkus. It's just like, that's the average, you know, you could be 1500 or the other person could be 3000. So, you know, it really is going to depend on your activity level. Yeah. Your height, your weight, your percentage of body fat, you know, lean muscle is, you know, um, causes your metabolism to do increase, which is one of the benefits of exercise. You know, you start working out, you get more muscle, your metabolism goes up, burns more fat. Um, i.e. you start losing more weight or you lose more body fat you know a lot of times the scale can be a little misleading when you first start working out because you start building muscle and you start losing fat but you're not really losing weight and you're like well i don't, I don't understand this i'm not losing weight <laughs> this this program's not working and it's like well weight loss isn't the end all be all um so you know yeah calories like i said if you find like you know the the main ones you can go online now and find like harris benedict equation mifflin st george um, and you know, other ones, you know, those are kind of your two big ones that are going to produce pretty quality, um, calorie, you know, four calories for you. Um, and then basically you're going to times it by your activity factor. So, you know, the Harris Benedict, you can actually, you know, if you wanted to get real precise, you could sit there. Well, I'm a office worker. So for 22 hours of the day, my activity level is, you know, 1.2. What, you know, based on my basal metabolic rate, which is just your BMR, or your basic metabolic rate is just what you would need if you laid there in bed to breathe and sustain life, like how many calories you would need. Um, and then you times that by like your activity factor. So like a, a normal activity factor is 1.2 to 1.3. And that's like 1.3 is lightly active. Like you're walking around a decent amount at your job. So you could actually take that like Harris Benedict times it by like 22 hours and then find, say you're in a two hour run at an eight minute pace, they actually have how many calories you would be burning per those two hours. And then you can kind of add all that up and find your correct calorie equation. So that takes a little bit more effort. 
Um, or you could just say, hey, times 24, you know, this is my BMR. I'm going to times it by 1.4 or 1.5 because I'm a little bit more active. You know, so it really depends on how detailed you want to go. A better way than finding calories really, though, is to really kind of portion your plates out appropriately, eating that four to five times a day, and then really watching your mood, you know, watching your your weight, you know, doing it maybe like a weekly weight. And if your weight starts to increase, you know, maybe we need to cut back on the portions, you know, probably cut back on the complex carbs first, you know, maybe not so much around your workouts, but maybe like the other meals, increasing your um, non-starchy, you know, carbs. So increasing more of the veggies, depending on how much protein you're eating, like, you, you know, protein's not really the issue. It's usually all the saturated fat that comes with or the extra sodium that comes with like your, your meats or um, canned beans that have more salt or something like that. Um, so you just want to be aware that whenever you're increasing your protein, you're also usually going to increase your saturated fat and also your calorie count. So you you might not, you know, cutting down on your portion of that might help you, but it's really just kind of monitoring yourself um, is a, probably a better way to actually figure out if you're eating enough. Like are you, after you're eating, are you walking away? Like I'm just stuffed, like your stomach hurts. We really shouldn't be trying to eat till we're, you know, just too full to walk around. Like, you know, meals should be, like I said, purposeful and they should also be distraction free. You know, whenever we're distracted, we tend to eat more. Um, so like if you're listening to, you know, fast paced music, you're watching TV, um, you're running around at work and you're stuffing your, you know, your, your face cause you don't have enough time. You know, you tend to actually eat more calories than you realize. So you really need to be, if you're mindful around your meals, it's going to be a lot more, uh, it's going to be beneficial for you to kind of know how much you're intaking. And that's really where a lot of people also graze, you know, they're at work, somebody's got M&Ms out, somebody's got some Snickers, you know, and people don't even realize they just walk by, grab one, pop one in, you know, that's like, say, 30, 40 calories at a time, you do that, you know, five, 10 times, next thing you know, you're adding like 200, 300 calories, you know, without even thinking about it. And then, you know, and like I said, that's where the purposeful, like, why are you eating that, you know, food? You know, it's very tempting, you know, some people might need to do tricks, like, you know, ask somebody to put it in a jar, you know, up top or something, or, you know, maybe find a new way to walk where you're working, you know, don't go down that path. If you really, if you can't, you know, handle the temptation or, you know, finding new ways to avoid grazing. But if, you know, cause that's really where we add a lot of calories That and usually drinks, you know, there's a lot of sugary drinks that add a lot of calories that we might not think, you know, like, like even alcohol, you know, alcohol, like a, a light beer still has a hundred plus, you know, usually around a hundred calories. You know, you're getting your more craft beers. They're up to around 300 calories a beer. Um, wines usually 150, 200 calories per glass. You know, not saying you can't enjoy those things, but it's just something to be very mindful of when you are um, in partaking. That was actually our, our next topic <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was alcohol. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, so <clears throat> I believe you and I both listened to the Whoop podcast. Um, and uh, they always talk about how detrimental alcohol can be to our systems um, yeah. in affecting sleep and recovery. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to touch on that for a moment. Um, you know, here in Western North Carolina, obviously, you know, we're kind of beer city USA. Um, and uh, we have a lot of listeners that, that, you know, do drink plenty of beer, which, you know, is, is that's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um what, what what is the effect? Um, you know, how much is okay? How much is not okay? You know, is there any kind of guidelines you could provide there? Well, as far as you know, be careful here. You yeah. could get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there is science to show that even one you know one glass will affect your sleep. Um, as far as like, because it's not maybe how long you're sleeping, but it's you know like the Whoop podcast or some of the other science shows that like. Yeah, your quality of sleep, like your your REM cycle, your deep sleep might be a little bit more affected. Um, you know, the standard, you know, two, you know, one glass for a woman, you know, two glasses to men is is pretty good standard to still follow by. Um, you know, if you're if and if you are really training hard and you're like, you know, you got a real a goal A race coming up, 
you know, maybe you push that off. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we sacrifice a little bit for, you know, our, our optimal goals or those, you know, long-term goals. Um, really, you know, if you can have a drink, you know, kind of more in the evening-ish time where it's like, you know, that five, six with dinner, you're probably going to be a little bit better off than saying like trying to have a drink and then trying to like crash out and go to bed. You know, you're so going you to have a drink with breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it, it actually, you know, yeah. It's probably not good for your work and environment, but <laughs> <laughs> biologically, you know, it's probably actually well, a little bit better. Now, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now with everybody being home, you might, might be able to get away with it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it just cause it affects your quality of sleep. Um, and you know, if you're, if you're really, you know, training and you're, trying to optimize everything else in your life, you know, that just might be something you want to either really just limit, you know, you can go out with a friend, have one, and then, you know, ask for water the rest of the night for a while. You know, ideally we're still trying to get, you know, home in bed at a reasonable hour and we're, you know, waking up at, you know, about the same time consistently every day to get that quality of sleep. Um, but yeah, like I said, the science has even shown that one glass of alcohol can actually affect your REM sleep. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off, you know, if, if, if you're not training for anything real hard, if that's kind of a way and you want to go out with some friends and have one or two glasses of, of whatever beer you're looking for, you know, that's going to, you know, that's perfectly all right. Everybody has their pleasures in life. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, going out and having like 10 drinks, you know, then we might, you know, you might want to talk with somebody else. You know, <laughs> I might not be the one you want to confer <laughs> with, but you know, um, you know, I'm sure we've but, all been in college and we've all done those things every once in a while, but no, no. yeah, no, I know. No. So not, <laughs> not the greatest health thing, but you know, we all, that's kind of the way of life at some point. That's right. Um, so, I mean, one of our, our, you know, our typical post-race traditions, like for our sport is to have beer, you know, post-race. Um, <clears throat> how is that? Talk about that for a second. Like in, in the, the course of recovery, is that um, delaying recovery if we have a, a beer post-race or, I mean, you know, is it okay? What, what's the, what's the thought there? Yeah. I mean, like one beer, right. Uh, you know, I would, I would kind of have some other, you know, maybe carby drink, or, you know, maybe a little bit of protein and then maybe have that beer and then go back to trying to, cause you are going to get some calories and most, you know, most beer is carbohydrates. Most wine is carbohydrates. Um, alcohol, the alcohol itself does have calories in it. So you're going to get that as well. Um, but as far and like, I've seen some stuff that says it does kind of slow, um, your recovery a little bit. So, you know, just in there drinking beer after beer, definitely not something you want to do. But if you're having like a knife craft beer because you just finished a hard race and you're relaxing and, you know, it's kind of like, can you, it's not going to be detrimental in your recovery that you can't also make up and eat healthy dinner, eat, you know, eat consistently after your race. Um, you know, after, after hard, long races like an ultra, you're really trying to eat um, consistently for like the next four hours worth of carbohydrates. So, you know, that beer can provide some of those carbs. And then, you know, those next couple hours, you know, um, you want to be eating another carb-rich meals for – they. the suggestion is actually one to two times your body weight in kilograms for the first four hours. So say like me, I'm like around 70 kilograms. Um, so I would want 70 grams of carbs after I finish an ultra for those first four hours. And, you know, and really, if it's a real hard, you can even do like really 70 to 140, which is a decent amount of carbohydrates um, to get in. So a beer actually will help you hit some of those. But yeah, just all drinking beer, that's that's not going to be helpful because <laughs> you will start to hinder some of your recovery. But if you're just having one but, after a race, it's like, you know, it's 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 not going to be so detrimental. You can't come back from it or anything. It is not to say that there's all negative effects. I mean, if we talk about some of the yeah. effects that, that wine uh, could potentially do, I mean, it's it's shown to, to do good things for the heart, like the red wines. Um, so, I mean, there's there are some, some benefits to it. So um, it's not to say that all alcohols are evil. I think um, if we were to list, you know, what's the most detri detrimental to ourselves, it would probably start with the, uh, the liquors, right? Liquor is probably the the worst for our system. I mean, there's yeah. some liquors that are going to be better than others and how they're distilled and such, but that's probably, I would say, you know, public enemy number one, so far as alcohol yeah. goes, would you agree? <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Cause liquor, you're just getting mostly alcohol. Um, you're still getting some of the grain. Um, but the other problem with liquor is, you know, then, you know, especially nights out, you're usually mixing it with a soda or 
a sugary drink or something like that. So you're kind of doing a double whammy if you're getting a lot more alcohol in a little bit and you're also mixing it with, you know, a not so healthy beverage on top of that. You know, the, you know, wine, you're right. You know, the polyphenols and the antioxidants from the grapes, um, you know, can be are healthy for you can be heart protective. Um, you can kind of get the same thing a lot of times from grape juice as well, but you know, <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're looking, uh, just for those, you know, yeah, wine's probably your best beer's probably your second. And then yeah, liquor's probably not as, you know, kind of third down the line, a little bit farther gotcha. away. Gotcha. Um, so we're going to take a pause real quick on the, uh, the nutrition part of this and just kind of <clears throat> talk about you for a second. Okay. Um, I can, I can see in your video, you guys have a, a number of uh, race medals hanging behind you. Um, <laughs> we neglected to, to mention um, your athletic background. Um, Jake has also done a number of ultras. And why don't you just take a, a second to kind of talk about your experience with, uh, with running? Yeah. Um, like I grew up playing a lot of team sports. So I played basketball, baseball, football. And then once I got to high school, I pretty much limited that to playing baseball year round, except for when basketball season came and I would play basketball for those three or four months for school. But yeah, I, in high school, I was kind of a baseball junkie. I, you know, fall, you know, school league, summer league, fall league, then basketball, then school league, summer league, fall league. I mean, I was probably playing, I don't know, 50, 60 games, a, you know, <laughs> for, for eight months. I mean, so, <laughs> but, you know, I really fell in loving love for running i always like to work out um and during the summer my dad my dad lived or where i grew up there was this seven mile loop where i could run out my house run around this big loop that connected a bunch of neighborhoods and then come back to my hat and it was like exactly seven miles and pretty much every summer i would get out and i would run that pretty religiously every day um so i've always enjoyed running up you know my big one when i was in high school was i decided that i was going to run it twice and do a, my own half marathon and that about killed me after <laughs> that was, it was a lot bigger jump. I thought oh, I run seven miles every day. I can do 13. That's not a big deal. <laughs> and that jump uh, was a little bit more. I mean, I made it, but it was a lot tougher than I thought it was going to be. But that, you know, I'm, so I've always had that instilled. I've always liked working out. I like how, you know, working out makes me feel. And I just enjoy the freedom of running. You know, you just walk out your, you know, your front door and you can, you know, go anywhere you want, really. I mean, obviously the, more fit you get, the farther you get to go. So, <laughs> and then, and you know, it's, go ahead. That was going to say, and it's, it's led you to, to ultras. Oh so, yeah. So like, yeah. so yeah, that was, so I went to NC state, you know, for about a couple of years and was doing engineering. You know, I definitely partied kind of my way probably too much. Um, so, and I just really found out that just because I was good at science and math doesn't mean that I should be an engineer. <laughs> and, yeah. So, you know, that took me a couple of years and, you know, a little bit regretful. I just kind of stopped, you know, wasn't the best part of my life. I just stopped going to classes, kind of, you know, dropped out basically and was worked in restaurants and bars and, you know, made decent money, but, you know, kind of lived out, you know, restaurant lifestyle of staying out too late, drinking too much and um, probably partying way too hard for what I should be doing. But, and running really did kind of turn my, start turning my life around. I, uh, you know, was at one of my best friend's house since like, he's been my best friend since, I don't know, since I moved to Fayetteville, like sixth grade. And his wife, well, they married, and I guess it was his fiance at the time. She had a magazine out and it had the city of Oaks marathon on it. And I was always like, I've always wanted to do a marathon. And, you know, I, like I, even with all my party and I always still kind of caped in semi, kept in semi shape. So yeah, I, it was about six or seven months out. And I said, I can do that. So I started running more, started reading, you know, I read the barefoot running book, got really big into chi running for a while. Like I read, you know, I got big into that. Um, but yeah, I ran my first marathon and about, about that almost killed me, but I've made it through and um, yeah, um, ended up by the third marathon. I decided, I was like, you know, I think I can go farther than this. So it took me a little bit while, but then I ran my first, like my first ultra was a 40 miler, the triple lakes in greensboro uh, um so and that was actually one of my better ultras you know so but yeah all the all the running led me into nutrition and i just was kind of fascinated like how what you put in your body how much it affected your not only body you know but also your mental health and um you know how you felt every day your recovery 
um, how it helped with your training games. And then being a bartender and a server, you know, I'd start talking to people and I just realized the kind of lack of knowledge most people had around nutrition. And it actually was funny that my, another bartender at the, I was working out at Chili's at the time. Um, she was actually going to school to be a dietitian. And so I was like, Oh, that's, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I'm like 25, 26 at that time. And yeah, I didn't even know what a dietitian was either. I was just like, Oh, you know, and then, so she kind of introduced me to the profession. I looked more into it and yeah, ended up applying to Appalachian state. And cause that's where I wanted to go. That's the only school I actually applied to. I was like, I'm going to get into here. And you know, I did all the stuff. I wrote him, wrote him a letter. I, I think I wrote like three letters to three different people, just like, you know, just trying to make sure that I got in and, you know, you know, telling them my story and things like that. And so they were, I was fortunate enough that, you know, they didn't look at my NC state records probably too hard, but more about where, where I might be going in life. And yeah, it was the best thing that ever really happened to me. It set me on a better path. I, you know, I don't actually, I don't drink now. I live a pretty clean, you know, lifestyle for myself. Um, and yeah, I just kept, kept up with the running. You know, I, I do, you know, I, I'm not a big high mileage guy. Uh, I probably do anywhere from 30 to 60 miles a week, depending on the race. But I also lift three, you know, maybe three or four times a week. So I do a lot more strength training and um, try to do, you know, yoga and stuff. I try to keep an all around, um, you know, healthy lifestyle. Try to eat, try to practice. I always tell people I try to practice what I preach, you know, <laughs> I That's try to eat as healthy as possible. You know, I'm not definitely not perfect. We definitely have our, you know, we'll have pizza every once in a while and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, yeah. So running really did help me get my life back on track. It helped me find my profession. And um, yeah, it's been a, I wouldn't trade anything, you know, trade it for the world. So. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I met uh, Jake's wife uh, at, uh, at NC State. Uh, she was on the team for a little while there. And uh, she was on the uh, Hoka Trail Towns. Is that right? The Yeah, the, the yeah. Asheville version. Yeah, so um, so uh, I'll post that video too. There's a YouTube video that Hoka did, Best Trail Towns, and you'll see yours truly in there. Yeah. In my ugly yeah. mug. So you can see uh, Jake's wife. Uh, they, they do a little bit on the shut-in trail, and she's a, she's a multi-time champion. Is that correct? She's That's won correct. the shut-in. Yeah, yeah, I don't so, know if she still she held the course record for a while. I don't know if she still holds it or not, but that's a good question. I um I could definitely look that up. Yeah, um, we've got a, a shut in historian that has has keep track, and uh, you know I, I'm pleased to say my name still stands at number two. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> after all this time. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's um so yeah. It's, it's, just, it's I always tell people our, that she she's the real athlete of the family. I'm just the pretender. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's my kids these days. They're the, the true the athletes, yeah. you know, I'm just an old man, yeah. um, <laughs> but, um, right. so let's circle back into, uh, let's talk about now race nutrition. So, okay. um, we were, we're both, uh, um, you know, really, we consider this part of the uh, part of our sport is uh, is the nutrition aspects of it. So, um, and we had a billion questions about the the you know <laughs> this. So, um, you know, if if, uh, if we start running long, we'll uh, we'll we'll do a second episode of the of the listener questions. But um, so, um, I think one of the big questions that people always ask is, a how many calories should I be consuming per hour? And to relate to that is how many calories can we absorb per hour? So, if, I mean, if we're taking too much, so obviously that can give us some gastro distress. Um, so we want to make sure we're getting the right balance. And that may be different for each other, but again, like, is there a type of, uh, a, you know, an average that we should be looking for? So, yeah, like, um, actually the International Journal of Sports Nutrition just put out a, one of the first ever um, position stands for single stage ultras. Um, which has been pretty enlightening. Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff was, you know, other things I found through, you know, research and uh, other articles, and they've, you know, did a good job compiling it. Uh, and really, the recommendations they've they've gone on, which you know, a lot of other people will attest to, is, you know, for anything less than fifty miles, you're looking for really 150 to 300 calories per hour, um, and then for 
longer than 50 miles, you're looking for 200 to 400 calories an hour. Um, you know, I, I, you asked me the question about how many can you consume per hour. I couldn't really find a good top top end limit. And really, you know, as we will probably hammer home throughout this whole little section of race day nutrition, the more you train your gut, the more you get it to be active, the, the more you can, uh, you know, absorb, you know, your intestines are muscles, you know, peristalsis is the term you use for how they contract and release, contract and release to move things along. Um, and then you also have your absorption rate. And the more you work it, the types of foods you have are all going to affect your absorption rate. So things that are like higher in fiber, you're going to absorb a little bit less calories. Things that are more simple sugar, you're going to absorb those faster and be able to absorb, absorb more of them. Um, and so then it also depends on how hydrated you are. If you're properly hydrated, you're going to be able to absorb calories better because you're your gut needs water to um, fuel the processes that, you know, needs to absorb across the intestinal membrane. And then, you know, you also need water to, you know, move things through your blood and all that good stuff. So if you're dehydrated, you're not going to be able to get that water to the the stomach because you're going to be using it more to cool your body off and your stomach is going to constrict more and tighten and you're going to limit your absorption rate. So that being said, um, really, it's, it, it really is a matter of training your gut, you know, on the race day, making sure you're hydrating efficiently, you know, the, you know, what types of foods, you know, you know, you want to be taken in or is going to affect um, the rate of absorption as well. And just also heat, heat and uh, even altitude can affect those types of things as well. <laughs> Okay, I want to touch on two things that you just talked about. Um, let's first talk about hydration. Um, so um, let's talk about hydration in um, the regard to um, daily. Um, you know, we, we talked about food a lot, obviously, but um, obviously hydration, as you just said, plays a key component in this whole, you know, scheme of things. Right. So um, what's, a, what's a good rule of thumb for um fluid consumption, um, you know, whether it be water or, you know, whatever the person's drinking, whatever fluids, how often should we drink and how much, et cetera. What's a good uh, guideline for people to, to go by on a daily basis? So if, if you actually did count out your calories, a good rule of thumb would be one milliliter for every calorie you take. So say you, you have a 3000 calorie diet, you'd be looking for about 3000 milliliters of fluid which comes out to roughly about a hundred ounces of fluid a day. Um, if you're, you know, if you don't know your calories, which we talked about, you don't actually need to know, um, you know, trying to hit about two or three cups of water. Uh, you really can't absorb too much more fluid past about three cups an hour. So if you're, if you're kind of hitting that, you know, hundred to 150 ounces a day, you're more than probably adequately hydrated. Um, you know, Harder days, obviously, just like in nutrition or the calories, you know, your more intense workouts, you're going to be sweating more, you're going to have more water loss. And so you're going to want to up your, um, your up your fluid intake. Um, so, you know, the, the harder you work out, you know, the more fluid you want, but, um, you know, the whole eight glasses of water a day, um, which is about 64 ounces, if you're just if you're taking a traditional class, really, there's actually not much science behind that. If it's, kind of funny it came from like a 1908 or 1918 i forget the date of a just random guy who had like and it was like a (laughs) group of like eight or ten people that he that was like the average intake needed for those like people and that's where eight glasses of water came from so (laughs) somehow that that got stuck in the psyche of every adult american from here on out so um (laughs) so you know the you know if you're training hard, you know, it, you know, really the way you should also look at it is in the morning when you wake up, some of the best hydration is first urination. If when you, when you go to the bathroom, Hey, are you peeing? Hopefully you're, you know, you should have drank enough where that you're actually peeing. If you're not, uh, that could also be an issue. You know, the color of your urine, you know, the first urination of the day is the most beneficial to look at. I mean, you can look at it throughout the day as well, but um, if you're waking up and you're peeing clear or light yellow, you're usually hydrated enough in the morning. If you're waking up and your urine's a little darker yellow or brown, you know, if it's brown, you definitely didn't hydrate enough and you probably need to have to drink a little bit more water that day to make up for it. The other thing to do is 
if you are measuring yourself, say you're measuring yourself daily in the morning, if you're seeing large fluctuations in your weight, um, like a large decrease, you probably didn't hydrate well enough the day before. Um, and also dry mouth. Like if you're waking up and you have that, you know, kind of um, dry mouth feeling, then you're, that's another sign. So if you kind of take those three principles in the morning of urine color, you know, weight loss and um, thirst feeling, you know, thirst feeling, those are going to be real indicators whether you hydrated sufficiently the day before. Um, and so that kind of gives you a problem. And so if you say, you know, yet, like I said, if you have dark urine, you're feeling thirsty, you probably need to increase your water intake for that next day. The other thing to, to know too, for, um, fluid after like, as far as like working out, um, after your workouts, if you've had a hard session, it might be, it, you know, it has been shown to be beneficial to get a little bit more sodium or electrolytes into your diet. Cause you've had more sodium and electrolyte loss through sweat. So to go ahead and start replenishing that um, through either like a noom tab or a salt tab, or, you know, if you want to just stick salt directly in your water, you could always do that. Although that gets a little bit, not the best <laughs> tasting, um, but that's going to help recovery. And then usually our food has enough electrolytes. If you're eating a well-balanced diet, you usually don't have to worry about it the rest of the time, but immediately after um, workouts is a good time to supplement with some type of electrolyte mixture. And we, we we throw around the term electrolytes, and a lot of us don't know exactly what electrolytes are. Can you define what an electrolyte is? What are what are the the nutrients that we're talking about? So your electrolytes are going to be your sodium, your potassium, magnesium, calcium. Um, these are going to really help with um, a lot of fluid retention. Um, you know, overall function, like your kidneys process a lot of these um, nutrients, micronutrients. And like the potassium and sodium are the two that we're usually concerned about the most because those help with fluid balance between your cells. So you want to have a good ratio because like potassium is a positive ion if you want to go into chemistry and sodium is a negative. <laughs> and so you need those to balance to help you balance your fluid between your cells. If you get one or too much of another, you might have you know, your cells swelling or you might have too much fluid outside of your cells which that's where a lot of like you'll see like a people's with their, their fingers swelling in ultras or, you know, during workouts, it's usually, you know, altitude can cause that as well, but they might be having some type of sodium issue or not taking in enough sodium to help that balance between um, fluid and fluid retention in your cells. If they do have swelling, it could be not enough sodium or too much. Yeah. Sodium. Not enough sodium. Yeah. <clears throat> not enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good point. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about electrolytes a little bit later on, but um, let's go back to the calorie consumption. Um, and so if we're in, if we're in an ultra or, you know, in a race, um, how often should we be consuming um, calories? You know, a lot of the, a lot of the gel companies are suggesting about every 35 to 45 minutes. Um, you know, so what, what do you think um, is a good what? rule of thumb for that? Um, yeah, if you're looking at trying to hit your, say your Dave, you just were on the low end, depends on your gel too. Let's say you're trying to hit that, you know, 200 calories an hour and most gels are hundred to 120. Now you have like your higher fat ones and stuff like that now, um, that are like the 250. But if you're trying to hit like the actual for, you know, for the races, you really should probably be looking at least every 30 minutes, um, for a gel. Um, and it, and if you really, you know, they show the kind of the, the higher calorie count you can get earlier in the race, the better off you're going to be. So really, if you're starting out and you can hit like, say, a, a gel every 20, 25 minutes um, and start, you know, working on a higher calorie load at the beginning, that's going to help you long term, you know, in the race because you're going to not be at such a deficit. You know, the, the hardest thing with ultras is that you're constantly at a deficit in calories. You know, you start running, you're burning calories say you're burning six to 800 calories an hour, you know, if we're doing two to 400 calories for that hour, we're constantly at a deficit. So the closer you can limit that gap of how much of a deficit is, the better it's going to be for later in the race. So like personally, like I try to take a uh, gel every 25 minutes and then um, try to switch to something a little bit more calorie dense, the farther you go. 
Um, so like after about three hours, I start switching to more real food, trying to get still like a protein source in there as well, a little bit more fat and things like that to kind of mimic how you would normally eat just while you're running. Okay. And if we're just going out for a training run, at what point would you suggest that we start carrying calories? Like what is the duration uh, so far as time goes that you would you know suggest that we bring calories with us? So if you know you're going to be out for any longer than an hour and a half, I would definitely start, you know, carrying something on you. Um, and really, if you're going to be out for an hour and a half, you, you probably want to start trying to eat something around the 45 minute to hour mark um, to get to get used to that, um, to eating really. Cause it's all, like I said, it's all about training. If you're training yourself, if you're constantly going out for like hour and a half, two hours, not eating anything, then you're training your gut not to be able to absorb any food. So if our goal is like, we know we're going to do an ultra, we know we're going to be out there and we need to eat as early and often as possible to you know make up for that calorie deficit. The more we can train and the more we can train the gut, the better off we're going to be. So really anything that you you know, your run's going to be anywhere from an hour and a half up. You really want to start training that way. You know, you, if you want to do like, you know, anything over an hour, you can still train and just to get used to eating, but really it's going to be more important for that. You know, yeah. Once you know, it's going to go over an hour and a half, you know, sci- like any races, you know, all the science now shows that pretty much anything 45 minutes and under, there's no benefit of taking in any calories as far as race performances. Um, once you kind of hit that, you know, hour mark, yeah, then taking something around the 45 minutes is going to improve performance as far as carbohydrates. And there's some really cool science out there about even just swishing, um, a carbohydrate mixture in your mouth will increase performance for that, like hour, hour 10 ish range. And that's something with like your, it's not even taste. Cause they've done, uh, it's something with like your receptors on your tongue, but it's not taste receptors because they've done like um what's a tasteless you know sugar and you still get the performance if you just swish it around but you don't get the same performance benefit from artificial sweeteners that you still taste something sweet so which is so and they've even done it where they've actually dripped um had somebody connected to um a tube feeding um and running and dripped carbohydrates into their just straight into their stomach and they didn't see the performance benefit in that first <laughs> like hour. So it really is something because you do have uh, amylase, which is where you first start processing carbohydrate. Um, so and breaking it down. So uh, my guess would be it has something to do with that. Like the enzyme recognizes it and somehow sends a signal to your brain um, and to like, you're going to get like, okay, we're about to get some energy because that's really what it is, is your body recognizes the carb and says, okay, we know we're going to get some fueling and we can push a little harder. So it's like, and in, in, even if you spit it out, which is kind of crazy because it, it thought it was going to get those carbohydrates. So it automatically, you know, lets your body run a little bit faster. Um, you know, that's kind of out of my, it's, it's, you know, the neurological and how that works is still kind of trying to be tested out, but it's, it's pretty fascinating when you, all the stuff they, they've done to break that down. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> some of our biggest questions came about um, gastrointestinal distress. Um, what usually causes that? I mean, I know there could be multiple causes, but what do you uh, what do you find usually is the culprit? Uh, you could have too much fat um, could be just slow down the absorption rate and your body's not used to it. That could be an issue for GI. Too much heat. Uh, your It's hot. You're not fueling it properly. Um, dehydration could be the other one. Um, you know, insufficient intake, like you you haven't been eating enough to keep your gut going and then you try to eat too much. And then, so your gut's like, Whoa, you know, I haven't been eating anything. Now you want to throw all this on me. Um, I'm going to, you know, so you start feeling nauseous, um, you know, eating that, you know, to like, say if you're trying to bomb down a hill and at the end of an ultra and you're just like, you know, going flat out because it's, um, you know, you're feeling good. It, that might not be the time to eat because you're putting more stress on your body and you're, you know, you're sending more energy to other parts of your body for, you know, coordination for your, you're pushing harder. And so you're sending more of your, your fluid in your blood to your extremities or your, more of the fluid area. And so your gut will actually shrink, shrink a little bit. 
Um, so a lot of times maybe doing it like on easier stretches where if you're hiking up a hill, it might be easier to digest than something, um, or you want to slow. Slow. yeah, yeah. So, or you're, or you actually slow down just a little, like your pace a little bit and eat. Um, so you are not pushing as hard. So you're, st- you can put more resources into your stomach or your, your intestines, I should say your, your intestines going to require more blood, this. right. To yeah. Digest. Yeah. Yeah. So, gotcha. cool. Um, <clears throat> and then. Um, what's a, what's a good way to counteract, uh, you know, this gut bomb, if you will, is there, you know, a good way to counteract that? Uh, well, I think if you figured that out, you probably could make a lot of money in the supplement area. I mean, you could try, you know, you can try like magnesium to try to help relax things. If you wanted to, you like, again, trying to slow down, let your body just process the food, give it, give it a second before you really start pushing it more. Um, try to stay away from high fiber foods, you know, things that are going to take more effort to break down. You know, you're the reason like fiber is definitely beneficial in your everyday life, but when you're running, you have to, you know, you can't absorb fiber. So you have to break the nutrients away from the fiber and then your body has to process the fiber to keep that moving. And then you also have to absorb the nutrients at the same time. So eating less fibrous foods, you will make your stomach not have to work as hard. And so that would be something you could think about. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you know, now that people are doing more high fat diets, some people um, can handle higher fat, um, you know, when they're running. But if you're not, if you haven't been trained in that way and you're not used to it, that's probably not the best thing because that can also cause some GI distress if you try to put like a fat bomb on yourself without actually having trained that way before. Now, if that's what Give you're doing in your... What? Give us some examples of things that would be like high fat. So if we're, you know, going across an aid station and looking at the smorgasbord, what's are some things that we should steer away from if we're trying to, you know, to not uh, die, you know, uh, grab things that are high fat. I know it's something like bacon, but yeah, you know, bacon's going to have things? a decent amount of fat, obviously with saturated, um, you know, now a lot of races will put out avocados. Um, you know, some people will, you know, drink, you know, butter in their, you know, a drink or something like that. Uh, you know, most race food is really going to be like, I'm sorry. Did you say put butter in their drink? Yeah. Well, butter in like a, you know, like the bulletproof coffees. I don't know. I guess I don't do that much on races. (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, like cheeses, you know, depending on how much cheese is in like a quesadilla, if you're, you know, can have a lot of decent amount of fat in it. Um, so that might be something that you just might want to think about, you know, it's going to have obviously the tortilla. Um, but cheese, you know, in general is more, you know, slows things down. And, you know, if you're ever having diarrhea, eating a bunch of cheese usually will help stop you up. Unless of course you're lactose intolerant or, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. what about, what about the fruits? Um, you know, some of the fruits can be, you know, high in fiber too. So are there anything in the, the fruit category that you should stay away from? Uh, if you really, uh, you know, more berries and stuff might be an issue with the fiber, um, like your watermelons or cantaloupes, those are going to have less fiber. Um, but still oh, like they're, they're mostly yeah. water and less calories in general. Um, so they're like good for hydration. Hmm? Uh, are the are oranges with like, you know, the high acidity to them, are they, they're still okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oranges. Some, you know, sometimes acidity can, you know, help or, you know, with your stomach. Um, yeah. I mean, most fruits are going to be fine because, uh, you know, the ones they put out there, cause it's going to have a little bit more simple sugar. Uh, I mean, yeah, you have to break away some of the fiber. Um, but most people are used to, well, hopefully they're used to eating fruit. So their bodies are accustomed, <laughs> accustomed right. to, to breaking that down. Again, it really goes back to training and training, you know, um, you if you're to? not used to eating it on your training runs, um, then you might want to stay away from it. You know, I kind of, you know, when I, when I race and the way I would, you know, I kind of train with people is aid stations shouldn't be your primary fuel source. You should be, dialing down your nutrition on your training runs that you know what you like, you know what you can handle. Um, and you should be packing those either in drop bags or carrying them on you, you know, crew, crew points, maybe them handing you more of the food. And then aid stations should really be there for like things that go wrong. Like you're, you missed your crew and you, you know, you just need food at that point. And then you should be trying to get things that are as close to what you've been training with as possible. Cause like I said, the gut really is a muscle and the more you train it, the better off you're going to be. Um, the more and you, you stick with what you're training. Like, you know, if you've been training for an ultra, then you, you know, go out and try to do a 5k and you realize, man, that was slower than I wanted it to be. 
you know, you can't really, <laughs> you know, yeah, you probably are still running pretty well, but you know, it's, it's like, well, that's not what you've been training for. So it's like, if I've been training with all these simple sugars and I've been switching to like tortillas and then on a race day, all of a sudden I eat bacon and then my stomach goes haywire. It's like, well, that's not what you've been training for. You know, that's not how you've been training. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you have to really, like I said, just train, train and train. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was you know, my worst experience at UTMB was I was not prepared for what they had at the aid stations. You yeah. know, it's, um, uh, and we didn't realize how little there was going to be availability on course for my crew to get stuff. And, you know, yeah. I mean, we just, uh, we were totally unprepared for that, which was, you know, partly our fault. I mean, lesson learned, but right. You know, right. We, when we got to a lot of the towns, they were, they were closed, you know, the stores were closed, so we couldn't get anything. Um, so it's just, you know, poor planning on, on my part. Um, uh, and then, you know, what was at the aid stations? I was like, Oh my God, I am not eating salami right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and, and geez, I mean, like that was like, uh, but yeah, it's definitely know. when you go overseas they're you know, their nutrition is a little different from our yeah. standard nutrition. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking about in-race nutrition and we kind of touched on gels. Um, and so uh, what's your, what's your opinion? We've, we've, you know, we've mentioned gels and what's, what's your opinion on gels? Are they effective or are they, you know, are they bupkis? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think they can be totally effective. Um, you know, they're, they're just simple sugars, you know, that are going to be absorbed pretty rather quickly. Um, like I said, if you're, you know, you, you need to train with them, um, but they're going to help you, you know, they're easy to absorb. They're easy to get in and out of your packs. They're, you know, you rip off the top, you spit one down your throat. Um, and you know, they're going to supply a immediate energy source for you. So they're definitely effective. I mean, should you be doing that the whole race? You know, most of the time you want to kind of start with more of the simple sugars and then transition to more complex or whole foods as you go. And then, you know, kind of use the gels every once in a while to supplement and get some of those more simple sugars. Um, but they're, they're perfectly good to use. I mean, you know, like anything, some gels are probably better ingredients than other ones. And, you know, if you can Is find a, a gel, sugar? I'm sorry. Is there a better sugar that we should be using? So you really want to be looking, for? you really want to be looking for just more of a, um, a glucose primarily dominated, um, gel. Cause you know, what they find is, you know, it used to be thinking that the science showed that you could only absorb about 60 grams of carbohydrates, and that was glucose at any time during an hour. So 60 grams is roughly about 100 and, uh, not 100, 240 calories. But now they show that if you do a mixture of glucose and then like 30 grams of fructose, you can actually get up to 90 grams of sugar in an hour or, you know, yeah, of carbohydrate. What's, and, what's that and, ratio? Like what's, what's, cause that was a question, um, a listener had, what's the, the glucose to fructose ratio? Um, so, they want so to know want what about, the, so it's about two to one is what they suggest. So 60 grams of, um, glucose, that should be your primary. And then fructose should be your, uh, your secondary. And I think, you know, they, you know, if you ever see, um, sucrose, which is like your common table sugar, um, I'd have to, double check myself, but I, I'm pretty sure it's around like 55% glucose and 45% fructose. If I remember correctly from like undergrad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so like, you know, that's, you know, table sugars like kind of will kind of get you to that mark. Uh, maltodextrin is your other one. That's going to be a little bit closer. Uh, maltodextrin is usually mostly glucose. Um, cause that's going to be like, and then, so, you know, sugar, uh, fruit, you know, fruit base is going to be a little bit more fructose. So depending on the gel, um, you know, it just depends on how they broke it down. Most of them are going to be glucose based though. Gotcha. They, they were asking about, um, maple syrup. <clears throat> is that a effective source for that, um, that ratio, but it doesn't sound like it. Cause, um, uh, I think, uh, he said that the maple syrup is typically nine to one, um, uh, glucose to, to fructose. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, it, you you could do it. I mean, and then just have maybe some, you know, throw some fruit on top of your, you know, you could just lo lower the, you know, maybe not make that a, your entire, uh, you know, energy source, and then have just have a, something maybe another gel that's more fructose based. Like I know those 
Springer gels now are mainly fruit based. And so that's going to have a, be a little bit higher in fructose and things like that. So, you know, you could still use your maple syrup. You just combined it with something else. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you have to stop, you know, using that. If that's, if that's been working for you. I know like Alicia for a while, she actually made her own little drink where she would pour ma- maple syrup and salt into a shaker. And that's how like, that was her hydration. And then she would also eat like, you know, as you know, other little things, but that was what she used to do. Um, so you could do something like that and then have like some other gels on hand and kind of balance it that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> um, one of my questions to you and kind of what we're talking about is, um, is it, should we rotate the the sugars if we're looking at that? But it sounds like you can just stay on that, that blend, uh, that ratio. Um, so. Yeah, you should be able to just stay on that ratio. There's, there's, there's not too much. I haven't really seen anything that suggests, you know, you need to rotate them to hit that ratio. It's just because like in your energy pathway, you know, your glu- glucose has to go through so many ways to, you know, when you're creating the lactic acid and ATP um, and fructose comes down like on like in a different area, you know, so like, and the energy pathway, like fructose comes in at like, you know, catalyst number 13 or something, whereas like glucose has to go through like 13 steps. And so I think that's the reason why fructose kind of gets to bypass, um, why you can absorb a little bit more. Um, I'd have to look at their research a little bit more intense to see if that's what they're theorizing. But to me, that's the theory that I would see why it's working because you're not using the same pathway to get that, make that energy. Right on. You do it okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, this was a question I posed to you as well as, uh, the listeners wanted to know as well, um, was about processed foods. Um, as I said to you, there was a podcast that said, um, you know, the, the, um, the guest had said that, um, we could rely on processed foods because they're easier to digest. Uh, and you have less chance of having uh, gastro distress. Um, any truth to that statement? <clears throat> Uh, there's definitely some truth to it is in the fact that, you know, it's basically whenever you process it, you're taking out the fiber. And so your body doesn't have to work as much to get, you know, the carbs from, you know, replace it from the fiber. And so it is easier. It's just simple sugars. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm assuming that's what he's, you know, that person, I would assume that's yeah, what they're he's saying like pop tarts and, you know, yeah, little I mean, all that, and all that kind of refined <laughs> grains and sugar. So all things with lack of fiber, all things that are going to be absorbed faster than, you know, your whole, whole grain or, you know, your, your fruit or things like that. So yeah, when like he's basically, you know, that's basically saying, you know, this way it's going to be absorbed faster and you'll get the energy, you know, you'll be able to make it into energy quicker than something else. It, you know, it's, it's good. I mean, that, like I said, like you should really be doing that more at the beginning of the race and then switching to more, you know, whole foods and, you know, again, what you've been practicing with it, you've, you know, right. Like, I think, I, like I think one of your examples on the question was like a pop tart. If you haven't had a pop tart ever, then it might, might not be the best thing to put, Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, just because yeah. you know, pop tarts are also filled with a lot of other, you know, additives that you might not be used to. So, right. um, again, it goes back to, if you want to try a pop tart in your training run, then, you know, try it out before the race day. But, you know, right. that, that all just goes back to easy. It, it is, you know, it's easier to digest because there is no fiber and other things to break down. They're yeah. a lot more simple sugars. And that was uh, to spin off that just for a second. <clears throat> um, one of the listener questions was that um, if we consistently eat um, uh, like a whole food um, healthy diet, um, but we use these processed <clears throat> foods that <clears throat> have the refined sugars and stuff, and, you know, in our training runs, <clears throat> is that detrimental to our diet? Um, should we be consistent? <clears throat> excuse me, with our diets. So as to say, you know, if we're eating whole foods and trying to be healthy, um, on our training days and our racing days, um, is it okay to, to go to these processed refined foods or should we stay consistent across the board? Uh, I mean that, you know, that could be your own personal decision if, as far as like just what you kind of believe, but as far as like being detrimental to your diet and overall health, No, I haven't seen any science that would support that you couldn't switch over to the processed, more processed foods while you're running. Yeah, I I would completely agree that, you know, switching to a whole food, you know, healthier diet, you know, outside of that is, you know, is what you want. You know, that's how you're going to, you know, keep your immunity up, help aid recovery, 
um, you know, just be overall healthy for life. But, you know, doing the simple sugars to help your body get, you know, absorb those more quickly and help with your energy levels during runs. Um, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that you're um, hurting your long-term health doing that. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're, you know, doing something crazy, like I'm trying to think of, you know, something with a toxin or something that, yeah. <laughs> you know, that you might, because, you know, whenever you're running, you're also going to absorb probably a little bit more or like post-workout, you're going to absorb um, things a little quicker. So you might absorb nutrients you know, that you might not want to absorb or unhealthy things um, as fast. So you still want to try to clean food, but like those, the gels and stuff, they're all just sugar. I mean, you know, I know sugar is bad and that's, you know, we all need to avoid everything of sugar in the world, but you know, that does have its place in time and purpose, you know, so it's not like it's filled with like, you know, some type of toxin in the, you know, they're not putting some chemical in it. That's going to make you, you know, be, you know, give you cancer or something later in life or something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so takeaway is really just, you know, we need to, to practice, um, you know, in our training, what we're going to do on race day, uh, make sure our gut's okay with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, like, like I said, just practice, 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 you know, you know, we do all this training and a lot of times we just take the nutrition part for granted. Like, Oh, we're just going to go out there. But, you know, I've even seen now where, um, you know, Olympic, you know, runners and like marathons, I was reading a report that they actually try to, you know, make them ingest like up to like hundred to 120 grams of carbohydrates during training runs per hour, just to like overwork the gut. So they get used to it. And so that way when they're doing like their 60 to 90, you know, during that hour there, it's a, it's a lot easier for them to absorb. So the, the more you can kind of throw on yourself, you know, the better really. Okay. Cool. Which I, yeah. It's a kind of a fascinating um, way. <laughs> is there any foods that we should be avoiding? Um, you know, anything that might cause inflammation or anything like that? Uh, I mean, th- I did see a report or a sci- an article talking about, you had a little bit more inflammation in your kidneys from drinking um, like dark sodas. So I know like a soda is a big thing. Um, you know, it was minimal though. And like it, your kidney function returned to normal after, you know, like a, a day later. So if you're really worried about it, maybe you have like kidney issues. Um, you might want to think about maybe not drinking that soda, but you know, outside of, dark sodas. Know, yeah, outside of the endurance, I'm hoping you're not drinking soda anyways, you know, I don't mean to bash all the sodas, but you know, they kind of add no nutritional value for you, just added calories. And again, that goes back to like, what's the purpose? Why are you drinking it? Um, you know, if that's, if that's like your beer or something that you want to have one, you know, cause you really love it and you want to do that, you know, for your own pleasure, then that's, you know, that's one thing. But as far as like what it's providing us for purposeful nutrition, you're not, you're not really going to get much from it. Um, other things to avoid, you know, I mean, just in general, you know, outside of races, I mean, you should be avoiding most ultra processed food, um, processed food in general, you know, depending on how you define it kind of may get a bad rap. Cause like, you know, frozen vegetables are technically processed, you know, can, can food is processed. So you want to look, you know, you want to kind of avoid the ultra processed stuff, which is, you know, you're ready to eat dinners or, you know, that's just going to have a lot more fat, salt, sugar in them than, than typically other meals would. So, you know, a good rule of thumb, if you ever look at an ingredients is, you know, three ingredients or less than all things that you know what's in it. Um, you know, like I said, that's a good rule of thumb. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be your entire pantry. I'm sure if you went to my pantry, there's going to be some stuff that has more than that. But, you know, for the most part, that's like, you know, whenever I'm looking at something new, I, I look at the back, you know, that that's what I always look at as ingredient list. I don't really care too much about the nutrition facts. Um, but I can turn on the back and see that it's just, you know, the food that it is and, they're using mostly whole food to make it, then I'm usually good with it. Um, so like I said, processed, you know, yeah, things are going to be processed. That's how our society thrives. I mean, we have to process, you know, you know, a bag of lettuce is technically processed. You had to, you know, take it from the field, process it into a bag and, you know, put it on a shelf, you know, so it just really determines how you, how you define the word process. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, you know, runners should be avoiding the same foods as most general public should be avoiding. Okay. Uh, go back to the fluids. Um, we have a lot of options on the market now to get calories through fluids. Um, <clears throat> what's, uh, what's your take on, is it as effective as consuming gels? Um, 
Is it any better? Is it any worse? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of, again, what you're training with, but it could be better in the fact that a, you are requiring yourself to drink fluid with your calories. You know, so if you're just drinking a gel, you might not drink enough water with it automatically. So it could be beneficial in the fact that you're, you're requiring yourself to drink the water with it. And so you're automatically hydrating and helping your gut absorb the nutrients. The problem with the fluids could be later in a race where if all you have is, you know, your fluid mixture and it's too sweet for you now and you don't want to drink and that's all the fluids you have on you, then it's like, well, now you're not hydrating. Now you're going to get dehydrated and that could limit your absorption of fluid intake. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. Like if, if you know you've been training with it and you don't get tired of it, then, you know, it's, it's going to be absorbed the same way. You know, you're still going to, it's still a simple sugar. It's still being, you know, processed the same way across your intestinal barrier um, and things like that. So it's really going to be preference on how you like to drink your gels. Like say maybe you're, you like your fluid and you have your, you know, water bottles up front and you got just plain water in the back. That way, if you got tired of it, you can still have your water to be drinking. Right. But that's really the downside, I would say, of, of only having like a, a fluid mixture um, with your carbohydrate solution is if you, you know, because we all kind of after a while, I mean, anybody that's been in an ultra for long, after you get some point, you know, that sweetness kind of you want to stop having, you know, that just bombarding with sweetness on you. So you, you tend to typically um, want, crave more savory foods later in a race. So, uh, you know, you might want to think about switching to a, you know, or having at least some water that you can, you know, transition to. So you're not only drinking out of that uh, carbohydrate solution. I usually have one bottle of, uh, uh, you know, tailwind or roctane and one bottle of water. Um, and then also mix it with like baby food. I carry like baby yeah. food packets, um, you know, or, uh, you know, a gel like to, you know, to get a, a hit of sugar. Um, I like to have a mix in my pack, um, you know, just so I'm not relying on one source um, or one consistency, if you will. Cause right. you know, like, you know, even the, the consistency can wear on you after a while. So it's kind of nice to have that, that variation. And then, you know, typically uh, if, when I see my crew or my um, uh, drop bag, you know, I'll have something else in there that I can pick up um, that will even change and give me a variation. Um, yeah. You know, so. No, that's, um, that's good. I mean, yeah. Cause I mean, that's, that's really the problem with a lot of people have is you get, you know, with the gels or the, the fluid is just, you get fatigue. Like you're just, you're, you, you know, if you keep bombarding, you're just eating that for three, four hours on end, you know, at some point your body's like, you know, give me something else. Come on, what are you doing to me? Um, so it's just, you know, your taste sensations start to change. So it, it is good yep. to change it up to <clears throat> that fact and make sure you have other things handy. Cool. Um, let's go back to electrolytes. Um, this is kind of our, our last topic here. And then if you got time, we'll go into the, the listener questions. But um, if, we're, if we're looking at electrolytes, <clears throat> how vital do they become as temperature increases? So uh, they become more vital in the fact that as temperature increases, your sweat rate is going to increase, you know, because you're going to be putting out the same effort level. But to cool yourself off, you're going to have to, you know, produce more sweat to cool yourself down. And anytime you're sweating, you're going to be losing more electrolytes. Um, so it's going to be more vital in the heat because of that reason, because you're just losing more in general. Um, so the recommendation for electrolytes is really, is mostly focused on sodium. Um, and that's about 450 to 700, um, uh, 400, no, I mean, sorry, 500 to 700 uh, milligrams an hour for sodium. And you can get that through your food. Most, you know, the most of those gels, most of those carbohydrate solutions, um, mixtures you mix in your fluid have some type of fluids. Your food's going to have it, you know, too. So it's not like you need a pill that's going to have all 700, but you might want to try to figure out how much you're intaking through those sources and then maybe have another um, pill or chew tab or something that you can supplement as well. Okay. So. The takeaway there is basically look at what <clears throat> you're consuming, especially your liquids, your electrolytes, to see how much sodium is in it. Um, 
And then if it doesn't meet those uh, those numbers, you said 400 to 700, was that correct? 500 to 700 was the- 500 to 700, okay. So um, between 500 and 700 milligrams, if we're not hitting that, then we could supplement it with something else. Right. Um, is there a danger of going over that number, like going over 700? Should we stay away from going over that much? Yeah, because I mean, you, you you still don't want to go over too much because you know then it's like still same with fluid balance. You know, you then you throw off the balance the other way, um, and you know then you might put a little bit more pressure on like your kidneys or you know your things. You know, hyper. You know, maybe make your heart contract a little bit too hard and things like that. So you really want to try to stay in that range as much as possible. I mean, like going over a little bit's not going to be, but if you're like mega dosing like two thousand milligrams every you know hour, might then that might you know, cause some issues. So you really want to keep a, a little bit, you know, that window. Okay. So we talked about the, the underside. So if we're not getting enough sodium, you said we might see some bloating, especially in the hands, fingers, yeah. et cetera. Um, on the other side of things, if we are getting, you know, too much, uh, you'd mentioned heart rate might increase. So we might right. get a faster heart rate. Are there any other signs that are showing that you're taking too much sodium? Uh, I mean, you know, the problem with like, over that is it's, it's kind of the same signs as like dehydration. That's where a lot of um, like you'll heal a hypernatremia and then hyponatremia, um, which is just, you know, that's hyper NA, which is sodium, the chemical symbol for sodium and natremia in the blood. Um, and so really they're like nausea. You can still have some bloating cause you're going to be, you know, swelling and, you know, in the muscles um, or in the cells not maybe as noticeable. Um, you might have like more, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I kind of lost my train of thought. So the, what was I? You know, We're sorry. talking about if, if it's okay. If we had uh, too much sodium. Um, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Are... So like, yeah, yeah. Bloating, nausea still might persist um, lightheadedness. You know, so you might be still developing those symptoms. Um, and so it's kind of like if you've been taking too much sodium in, you might want to reduce it at that point because you, you, you're you not feeling well. Um, and it's the same true as if you haven't been taking any sodium, you kind of feel those symptoms. You might, you know, increase. So it's kind of one of those you might want to know which, which uh, spectrum you're on, whether you've been taking in a lot of sodium or not enough. Cause that's where like, you know, you'll hear about the random marathon runner who, you know, passes away. You don't hear about it as much as it now, but that's where you get the hyponatremia, which is obviously serious because your, you know, your blood pressure can drop because you don't have the sodium to help um, keep it within balance. And that's, you know, that came from that whole, you know, don't drink to thirst, drink, just drink constantly, drink water. Um, and so you, if you, if you do that, you can actually dilute your blood from electrolytes and then that becomes an issue. Um, you know, usually in ultras, even if you're not taking a sodium, you're also eating a lot more. So that kind of negates some of that factor. So you're not in as risk. Whereas like a marathon, you might not be eating that much trying to push through and then you are just diluting yourself. Um, and that's the same, like there's, you know, those, that's why like, um, those frat, what was it like? This was, I think it was back in like my high school days where like those kids like passed away cause they would, the frats made them, you know, for hazing chug, like just gallons of water at like a oh, time yeah. and then you just dilute your blood sugar so much and your blood pressure drops out and then you end up passing away unfortunately so i mean that's that's why it's always important to have like a you know appropriate fluid but also mixing in with some sodium and like i said you get you'll you'll get a decent amount through food and if you're eating like the hyponatremia won't come but you you know you might be still sodium deficient in the long run gotcha so be cognizant of how much sodium you have already yeah. in your mixture right 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 on cool thank you you good on time for now yeah how much how much okay. questions we got uh well i think we answered some of them so okay <laughs> but like i said throw up the white flag if you need to i want to be you know conscious yeah. of your, your time too so thank you um so we had uh a few that uh wanted to know um are there foods that help absorption of fluids and the contrary, are there uh, foods that block absorption um, of fluids? Um, I mean, that's really going to be back to like a uh, fluids. So you're, you kind of, I mean, this, you, that's going to be more your electrolyte. Like, like if you don't have enough sodium too, that you're not going to absorb um, the fluids as well. 
Um, so it's, it's going to be more of your, like your minerals. So like having a good electrolyte balance is going to help you with your fluid retention. Um, and so not so much foods, but, you know, making sure you're eating, you know, having like an electrolyte solution or your sodium to help with, uh, fluid, um, retention and, um, absorption. So otherwise you won't be able to absorb as much fluid, but a certain, I'm trying to think of a certain food. I mean, anytime, like if you're just not drinking enough fluid and you're trying to, you know, but that's, that goes back to more fluid, you know, just overall. You could just uh, I mean, like, you know, if you're, <laughs> if, if something, <laughs> if like, you know, you're lactose intolerant and you eat dairy and all of a sudden things are just flowing through you too quickly, you know, that might have an issue through like diarrhea. You could lose fluid loss. Um, so if you're having an issue with diarrhea, trying to make sure you're drinking a little bit more fluids because you're obviously not going to be absorbing them as, 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 as well, you know, taking like a, a probiotic, you know, just for overall gut health can help with just, you know, absorption of nutrients, but also just gut health in general, which is going to help with, um, you know, your fluid absorption and food absorption. Um, you, know, you can do that through like, basis. I'm sorry. You're just talking on a daily basis, right? On a daily basis. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, cause probiotics really shown to be only effective when you're taking them consistently. Like if you're eating a healthy diet, you're going to have a better healthy, uh, microbiome overall than, um, if you're on a, you know, standard, you know, the standard American diet. Um, so, you know, you could, if you're eating a crappy diet, probiotics really aren't, you know, they might give you a little bit of benefit, but you know, the benefit goes away if you continue on your diet. You know, like if you if you were taking probiotics every day for 30 days and you noticed a little bit of improvement, then you stop the probiotics and continue your normal diet that was already poor, then your microbiome is going to go back to being poor as well. Yep. So an overall healthy diet is always going to be beneficial for gut health and just overall health. Um, one of our next questions, we talked about um, how much protein we need. Um, does age affect that number at all? Is there, you know... For the older athlete, should they be consuming more protein or less protein? So like, as you age, you actually do need a little bit more protein because you're not as efficient as um, utilizing the protein. So you are going to have to increase your intake. Um, you know, once At what you age? That, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry? At what age? I missed that. Oh, uh, I mean, just as you age in general. So like, you know, you know, 40-year-olds would be a little bit better than 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds. Um, so just as you age, the higher you get up the, the, your body's, you know, cause your body's kind of, you know, digressing, you know, the healthier you keep yourself, the slower that rate of, um, utilization will de decrease. So, um, does that, did I say that right? So as, as you know, so the healthier you keep yourself and the, you know, more on, you know, you more utilize it, it you're not going to have a decrease of somebody that's, you know, not aging as healthily and keeping their body as in shape. Um, but like, you know, the, you know, now, like since I do work in long-term care facilities, you know, the average recommendations about 1.2 to 1.3, even up to 1.5 sometimes for people of just, you know, 80, 90 years old, because their um, protein utilization and absorption rate or, or utilization rate is poor. Um, so that's something I always keep in, keep in mind. All right. Um, so, uh, we, we touched on, um, you know, a lot of stuff for during ultras, but um, one question was uh, best food for ultras for those with overactive stomach acid. <laughs> uh, overactive stomach acid. Huh. So they tell me like they're like, they're actually like they're, I guess, you know, more alkaline foods, if you can get, you know, try to get some more um, veggies in there, you know, like your, you know, your cabbages, your broccoli. I mean, I would try to do that, maybe not in the races, but in your daily life um, to try to help decrease the, you know, your acidity levels in your blood and your, in your GI. I mean, everybody's stomach is very acidic. I mean, your, your stomach's acidic for a reason to help start breaking down food and, um, is he, is he having, I wonder if like they're having like ulcers. Is that why they say their stomach acid is? I don't, uh, I'm not sure if they've had ulcers or anything. Um, would you uh, recommend like the, the stomach pump inhibitors kind of like your Prilosex and all, you know, that type of. Uh... Well, those types of things, you know, are, are, are good for, 
heartburn and the immediate, um, you know, if you need them, you know, they're definitely appropriate. Um, you know, like I said, if you, if you're trying to do it by diet, definitely eating more of your, um, vegetables based in primarily like your cabbages, your broccoli, your cruciferous vegetables, um, kales, you know, things like that to help, um, bring around down the alkalinity. Um, you know, your, your GERD in general can be very, uh, you know, individualized, you know, some people can eat spicy food and not, but have a problem with coffee where other people can't have spicy food, but can drink all the coffee they want, you know? So like what causes your own, you know, I work with a lot of people with GERD and it's, it's all over the board. Like, I mean, there are certain foods like usually spicy food, coffee, you know, chocolate, um, you know, laying down too quickly, which that's kind of a one for everybody. If you're after meals, um, uh, sometimes acidic foods, so like your tomato sauces, lemons, you know, stuff like that can cause it. But like I said, you know, some people can eat tomato sauce and, you know, but not have lemon. And some people can eat, you know, can eat spice, you know, can't, can eat all the, you know, can't have tomato sauce, but can eat spicy food or something. So it's, it's really about paying attention to which foods are causing you more issues and then trying to avoid those going forward. Um, another question is how can plant-based uh, athletes get B12 omegas and fatty acids into their diet. Um, is there foods that are better for that or should they try to supplement it? And if so, what's, what's a good way to supplement it? So if you're looking, let's see, we'll take each one of those. So B12 is there's like, if you're just trying to use food based, it's, I mean, you're, you're pretty much looking at nutritional yeast, um, and putting that on just, everything. So that's like brewer's yeast, your nutritional yeast, they're going to have B12 in it. Otherwise you're going to have to look for foods that are fortified with B12. I know a lot of like the plant-based milks now have B12 in them. Um, a lot of drinks like the Life Aid waters. Um, I, I started drinking those. I don't know. I mean, I'm the product placement, but those, those fit aid water or fit aid drinks, find them a lot of like CrossFit gyms and stuff. And they have B12 in them. Um, so it's that, or you could take a weekly 2,500 milligram um, pill and cause you actually B12 is a uh, water soluble vitamin, but you actually, um, it's one that just it. Well, we have actually re- retained it. Intestine? Yeah. It's, right? uh, the, yeah. I mean, every, everything's pretty much digested through the small intestine. I mean, there's a couple, um, but B12 is like one, like if you ever have, uh, somebody, you know, starts taking out your colon or your, or your small intestines for like Crohn's disease and stuff. Like you can have malabsorption issues or for like bariatric, um, surgery, you know, you're bypassing right. some of the small intestine, you can have B12 issues. Or like a, but a slow absorption, right? For the, yeah, the B- it'd be cool. You, cause you actually retain the B12. Like, so like you actually, like you'll it, like, say you took 12, 2,500 milligrams you need, uh, or micrograms, um, for a B12. Um, and then you actually need like two, like what was it like two up top of my head? I think it's like 200 micrograms a day, but you'll release that. You actually hold on um, to that. And so if you just take like one pill at 2,500 micrograms a week, you'll hit your B12. And if you just did that weekly, um, you should be fine. Okay. Let's uh, talk so about that's the one way. To, so that's, that's a, so you either need to fortify foods, nutritional yeast, or take like a weekly pill. I mean, you could take daily pills if you want to do smaller amounts, but you know, you can buy one of those, you know, bottles of B12 for pretty cheap. Let's see. Omega three was the other one. Um, Omega oh, so yeah. <clears throat> so you can do a couple of things. Like you know, there are like flax seeds, walnuts, um, other nuts, um, and other foods are going to have. They're not technically omega three. They're like the precursor to omega three, and our body doesn't quite process. Um, it's like a ten percent utilization into like the actually like omega three category. Um, so we, you need a little bit more if you're going to just do it all food. If you're just looking for a, you can find algae sources of pills though from omega three, if you don't want anything, um, to do with animals. So they have plenty of algae source omega threes that you can take and, you know, take those one or two times a day. And I would still, you know, nuts and seeds and things like that. I would still include in your diet because those are just going to be healthy for your, your healthy fats and proteins. The other thing I don't know when I've tried to find research on this and there's just not much out there because, you know, you, the big thing with omega three is you want your ratio because omega three is anti-inflammatory. Omega six is inflammatory. 
And the problem was like, say like, um, like grass, not grass fed, um, like meats and stuff or dairy, they have more of the mega six. They do have some omega three in them. So, but the, and the ratio is more than we want. We're like, we want like a two to one ratio between omega six to omega, um, omega threes. And so I off like what I can't find is if, you know, the recommendation for omega three is often based on our typical intake for omega sixes. Um, so, but, uh, a plant-based person isn't going to be having as a meg- as many omega six, um, fatty acids. So, you know, your needs might not be as high, but you should still be supplemented because it is still hard to get. And you still are going to get through other foods, omega sixes, but yeah, like there's no good research. I've asked, I've actually had some speakers on heart disease talk about the ratio. And then I always bring this question up and nobody can ever give me a good answer. And I don't think it's, I got, I don't think it's well researched at this point as far as like, if you strictly reduce your omega sixes, can you also, you know, not have to worry about getting the adequate amount or the recommended amount of omega threes. So if anybody wants to do any research, you know, papers out there, then <laughs> <laughs> I'd be, I'd be curious about that topic, but yeah, I mean, still supplementing, you know, they've, they've shown that it just helps with, you know, um, your neurons in your brain, your, um, aging and things like that. So, you know, so yeah, either your, your nuts, your seeds are going to be your two biggest sources of, um, apholinolinic, <clears throat> Uh, which converts into the like EPA, um, which I'm blanking on that, what that one stands for, but your omega three, you know, cause for that conversion or just finding an algae based pill are going to be your best sources okay. for omega threes. And fatty acids. The, well, the omega three is the a fatty oh, acid. Excuse me. So. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, and I'm then, fine. um, <laughs> I like this question. Uh, is it better to have a cheat snack once a day or a cheat day once a week? <laughs> uh, how about a cheat meal? Can we do that <laughs> once a week? <laughs> uh, you tell us. You're the doctor. Uh, I mean, because it, and I guess it depends on what they count as a cheat. You know, it's it, and when you're having it too. You know, if you're going to have something to cheat, maybe a um a you know, if you're going to have like a, say a more sugary cinnamon roll, it probably actually is better to have it in the morning when your body's more adept to handling the blood sugar response. But even that, you know, doing that every day wouldn't be the beneficial. You're not going to get your protein from it in the morning that you need. Um, you know, a whole day though. I mean, you know, we really should, we should, you know, if you're going, like, if you're going to do like meals where you're like, just like cheating, I guess, then trying to add like, find a way to still have something that's going to be beneficial. So like still, you know, if you're going to do the burger, you know, and maybe you want the fries, but maybe reduce the portion of the fries, add a side salad or, you know, broccoli. And so kind of make two sides out of it. Um, Maybe you load up the burger with a little bit more spinach than you usually would. Um, You know, if you're going to do pizza, try to get a pizza with a little bit more veggies and maybe eat a salad beforehand, you know, so kind of maybe portioning those, the unhealthy meals down while still adding a healthier side item or something to help you out would kind of be my, you know, suggestion. Uh, next question is about, um, in race, if the runner is nauseous, um, <clears throat> during a long run or a long race, uh, is there a, a best way to try to get yourself reset so that you can get in calories? Cause you know, uh, a lot of times people get nauseous and then they just stop eating. Um, is there a way to kind of settle the gut back um, and get yourself back on track? Um, you know, a lot of times um, the courses will have like, you know, the the ginger chews or, or something like that. But are those effective um, or is there another better way that we can help reset the gut and get back on track? Uh, so like we've talked about in, earlier, you know, making sure that you're properly hydrated. Let's say maybe drinking a little bit more water with a little bit sodium to see if that's the issue. Um, the ginger chews, you know, they do show like some, you know, research is kind of back and forth, whether ginger is helpful. I mean, there is definitely some studies to show that, you know, ginger helps with nausea. Um, and there's other studies that show it's, you know, maybe about the same as placebo. So, you know, but if placebo works, it works, you know. Um, but I would, you know, anytime that somebody's feeling nauseous, maybe, Make sure you're drinking, you know, keep drinking water, maybe switch to something that is either like a little bit more simple sugar, 
just so your gut doesn't have to work as hard. So reducing anything that might have been fibrous and maybe even slowing down for a little bit because, you know, slowing down right then, you know, maybe, yeah, you might lose a little bit of time. I'm not saying stop, but just, you know, slow your pace down so your your body can absorb or not absorb, um, utilize or send more resources to the intestines to kind of help itself out. And then once it starts feeling better, you can start picking it back up. Um, you know, if you're close to the finish and you're in a tight race and, you know, you maybe you just want to push through at that point. But if, say, you got, you're got a mile 60 of a 100 miler, you know, go ahead and trying to slow down fuel with simple sugars um, that you're, so your body doesn't have to work as hard and make sure you're drinking plenty of fluid with a little bit of sodium um, would be my suggestions. And to, you know, keep, keep doing that until it feels better. Cause you still want to eat. Like if you're nauseous, I know it sucks, but you still want to try to get something in your, in your gut to, you know, you can kind of hold off maybe for like, you know, a little bit to kind of relax yourself and then, but you still want to be eating, you know, throughout the hour. Um, I'll go with the last question here. Um, I apologize to the, the people that submitted others, but I think it would just <laughs> take too much time. <laughs> so um, best food to keep you awake for events over 24 hours uh, that are non-caffeinated. So they're, you know, they're trying to do this in a non-caffeinated way. That are non-caffeinated. Um, yeah. So is there, is there foods that will help you um, stay awake? I mean, you know, would we look at like a high sugar content to, you know, kind of get the, the blood, you know, rich with, <laughs> with sugar and you're like, ah! <laughs> well, I mean, at that point, I mean, we're, cause we're already doing simple sugars, you know, most of the, you know, the race, I mean, if you're not looking at caffeine, um, you know, the, like, you know, chocolate is going to, but that's, you know, chocolate might give you a little boost, but that's cause it's got a little bit of caffeine in it, you know, mm. um, you know, things like, you know, green tea, that's cause it's got a little bit of caffeine in it. Um, yeah, sugar is going to, but if you're already that tired, um, and you're trying to stay away from caffeine, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe some like something with like B12 in it to just, you know, help to make sure that you're not depleted there. But, um, just cause that is a, does help with uh, energy metabolism because anything that, but you're, you know you're up for 24 hours, you know, 24, 25 hours. There's a reason why you're tired. Um, <laughs> you know, it's because yeah. you haven't slept, you know, it's your body's natural response. So a food, you know, I wonder why the, the reason I'd like to know the reason why they're trying to stay away from caffeine. I mean, just out of, I mean, cause caffeine yeah. itself yeah. is actually very effective, you know, later in stages in race, that's when you really want to utilize it, you know, caffeine at the beginning of the race you know for a long race there's not much point to jack yourself up and then come crashing back down in the you know middle you know 12 hours into a 24-hour race um so really like the suggestion for caffeine use is to use it at the end of long ultras to help you stay awake and to finish races um, I, I think that's uh definitely a, a, a thing we could talk about on another podcast i think we have a a lot of things here that we could expound on so i think you know if we want to do another podcast that, that would be great um yeah. i've already taken about <laughs> two hours of your time so um i sincerely appreciate it jake thank you for for coming on today um if you would how could people uh reach out to you so the uh, easiest way really is just through email. That's the way I respond the quickest. Um, Edmiston, RDN at gmail.com. Um, I'm on Facebook. Yeah. I'm on Facebook at Jake Edmiston. Um, on Twitter, although I don't do much on Twitter, like my social media presence is pretty you know, <laughs> poor <laughs> in general. Uh, but I am on Twitter. I, it's either you can look up Jake Edmiston or I think my handle I made a while back was uh, Mountain to Molehill. It's always something I've always enjoys. I don't, you know, I made it, you know, everybody always says don't make a um, molehill into a mountain. And my thought for running or anything is, you know, make mountains into molehills, take little hey. steps, keep progressing. So uh, you can find me on there. Um, and that's pretty much the easiest way, but yeah, email, I, I, I'm on, you know, unfortunately I'm on my computers and email a lot of the time. So if you shoot me an email, I'll usually get back to you pretty quickly. And Jake is available to athletes. Um, so if you want to reach out to him, ask more specific questions, um, you know, Jake can, can tell you about his services and what he does. Um, you don't have a website, do you, Jake? No, I, I probably need to 
I'm, I'm working on one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jake can tell you about his services if you want to reach out to him. Um, any last uh, words of wisdom that you want to impart? No, I think just the biggest way, you know, biggest thing I always try to tell people is be really mindful and purposeful with your diet. Try to avoid, you know, just the grazing and unconscious eating. Um, what are you dieting for or not dieting? What are you eating for? Um, and then for as far as racing, just train your gut, train it some more, keep training and then, you know, keep using those same principles on race day. Excellent. Jake, once again, I want to thank you for your time and, uh, we'll probably have another podcast cause <laughs> I think we have more questions and things to talk about. So, um, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to that. But once again, thank you, Jake. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned something from that episode. Uh, I want to thank Jank again for coming on. As he said, you can reach him at Edmiston, R-D-N, so that's E-D-M-I-S-T-O-N-R-D-N at gmail.com. I'll post his contact and the resources we talked about in the episode uh, on the show notes, as well as a link to Jake's uh, rates and services if you're interested in pursuing uh, those things further. If you have ideas for future episodes or things you'd like to hear on this podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at runningpains at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's uh, Aaron Saft. And follow me on Facebook and Strava. Once again, thank you, my friends, for your ears. Um, Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you next time. From the MR Running Pains podcast, this is Aaron Saft. (laughs) 